Welcome back, party people. Mike here with The Social Life of Language. And today is kind of an extension of a previous video I made on a chapter written by Patricia Hill Collins entitled Mammies, Matriarchs, and Other Controlling Images, found in the book Black Feminist Thought. Each of these videos explains controlling images theory from a different starting point. So it doesn't really matter if you watch this one first or the older one first. But if this is the first time approaching this theory, we'll be talking about how stereotypes potentially control or influence people's perception and can even influence the way events unfold. In that first video, I pull a lot of quotes and examples from the chapter itself. But today we're going to do something a little bit different. The goal for this video is to formulate a kind of mini guide to doing your own controlling images analysis. And we're going to do this by focusing on two recent examples. So first, we're going to analyze a recent Vogue magazine cover featuring Rihanna and ASAP Rocky, which was accused by some folks of supposedly emasculating black men. I know what you're thinking. Is it Rihanna or Rihanna? Rihanna or Rihanna? Rihanna. I say Rihanna, but Rihanna is still okay. And in the second example, we look at a Fox News clip where you see these two people trying to make sense of what happened in the recent murder that involved five black police officers. As usual, we're going to start super simple and then gradually complexify. So how do you do a controlling images analysis? Let's find out. Let's review the first question that most people have. Is a controlling image and a stereotype the same thing? So it's true that both controlling images and stereotypes both deal with idealized images that we put together based on information we know about a particular person or a group. That consolidated information might be well-informed or it could be deeply misinformed. But either way, we use these idealized images to help make sense of the world around us. So if they're both idealized images, then why not just call it a stereotype? Now, I think what Hill Collins was doing here is reframing these idealized images in a way that makes us think of what these images do in the world and also how they become empowered to do it. Specifically, the name controlling images foregrounds the potential to control perceptions and even influence the way events unfold. So I think the difference has less to do with the actual idealized image and is more so in the way that a controlling images approach to stereotypes creates new questions that we can try to answer. For example, how does an image actually become powerful enough to influence society? Who uses these images for their own benefit? And who do they oppress? Now, when we think of the popular understanding of a regular old stereotype, we know that it's an idealized image of something. But that's kind of that's kind of it right there. We know a stereotype is an idealized image of something. The analysis pretty much ends right there and there aren't any questions ready to be asked with the term stereotype. We generally don't think about how stereotypes have become empowered over time or how they behave when used. On the other hand, a controlling images approach to stereotypes directs our attention to these exact issues. So Hill Collins has given us this analytic framework to use and today I'm gonna show you how to do it. Or specifically, I'm gonna try to reformulate Hill Collins' chapter into a guide to analyzing stereotypes yourself. The original text is super dense, but when explained as a method or as an approach, much of Hill Collins' theory becomes really easy to understand. So let's get down to business and try to list out some guiding principles to remember for lack of a better word. To me, perhaps the most important thing to remember is the thing I notice every single time I do a controlling images analysis. Always try and remember where there is one, there are many. Meaning if you see one controlling image, I guarantee you there are secondary controlling images lurking just around the corner. And as we will see, those secondary images are extremely important. Notice how this is very different from thinking about regular old stereotypes. Because we kind of imagine stereotypes to work one at a time 
alone and in isolation. We cannot say that if we are using a controlling images approach. We must consider all the surrounding secondary images. Let's start with this Vogue cover of musical artists ASAP Rocky and Rihanna and identify what controlling images are present. When this cover came out for whatever reason, some folks got really mad that this was supposedly contributing to the overall emasculation of black men and also that Rihanna was being presented as an overly masculine black woman. Soon after this cover came out, somebody made this edit, where it categorizes Rihanna as a strong, masculine, dominant woman. So clearly here, there is at least a pair of controlling images present. And this brings me to the second thing to remember to do when conducting your own analysis. To find the many, look for oppositions. So what does that mean? Well, if you notice a controlling image that involves perhaps an idealized version of a bad woman, then we gotta consider how that controlling image is based off of ideas of what a good woman is. Or another opposition might be an image about what is considered masculine, which then we must put in relation to what is considered feminine. So one of the first things that I do is look for the oppositions and the opposites. Now, when I say controlling images never work alone, I mean that each controlling image needs to point to another controlling image to make sense. So we might say that controlling images emerge in relation to other controlling images. So let's look at the Vogue cover again. According to the commentary, Rihanna is a strong, dominant, masculine woman with a hard face. And ASAP Rocky is a submissive, nurturing, feminine man. Most of those characteristics might be considered oppositions or even opposites. And they feed into each other in order to make sense. For example, let's see what happens if we take out ASAP Rocky from the Vogue cover. Suddenly, without ASAP Rocky in the context, the the idea of a masculine black woman just doesn't make sense. It's really hard to characterize Rihanna as dominant without someone in the picture with her being submissive. So always remember to look for those oppositions because it's those oppositions that feed into each other to help each image make more sense. Suddenly, Rihanna does not really have a hard or tough looking face. Suddenly, maybe it's just a feminine face. We might say then, an important part of analyzing controlling images is to look for the way controlling images rely on each other for coherence. And I think that is a major difference between controlling images and a stereotype. A stereotype does not appear to need a second stereotype to make sense, meaning stereotypes appear to imply information about only one thing or person or group. If you were listening closely, I said the word appear like 50 times. Because our popular understanding of stereotypes would only consider the stereotype to be about that one thing. This is simply not the case if we're doing a controlling images approach to stereotypes. Because we are trying to think and understand how stereotypes work. And specifically how they point to each other to get that work done. Now because we are entering this analysis understanding that controlling images always work together, it becomes much easier to see that controlling images potentially carry a whole lot more information about how society works than, for example, a singular stereotype that we imagine works alone. The reason this is supposed to be offensive to ASAP Rocky or black men in general is because, according to the commentary of this photo, Rihanna is inappropriately assuming the role of an idealized man. That means in this photo we have at least two controlling images. One about an idealized man and another about an idealized woman. But there are still more controlling images present on this cover. They're there, they're just kind of lurking in the background and we gotta figure out how to find them. And this is where I get to the third thing to remember. When there are no secondary controlling images explicitly present. They're still there, it just simply means that you need to trace the history of the controlling images that you can see. As Hill Collins tells us in this chapter, controlling images are dynamic and ever-changing. That means that sometimes what is present 
are much older controlling images that have evolved over time, which means that sometimes a single image is actually a composite or a combination of more than one image. Sometimes it's many images smashed together. Now to me, the best controlling images analyses always trace the evolution of images across time to help uncover the ideological beliefs that are hidden or obscured from view. So if I had to list out the guiding principles so far, I'd say first, where there is one, there are many. Next, I would say to find the many, first to look for oppositions. And next I would say, to find even more, trace the history of the images you can see. In Hill Collins chapter, she identifies several controlling images of black women that have proven to be quite durable over time. So let's add a historical dimension to our analysis of Rihanna on the cover. To know where all of these accusations are coming from, we must consider what historical controlling images of black women are still lurking in the background, even if they have evolved over time. One of the controlling images Hill Collins identified is what she called the black matriarch. Now this idealized image of the black matriarch is imagined to be this, you know, tough black woman at the head of the family, is super tough, makes the money, and supposedly emasculates men. Because of that, she is supposedly more likely to be single because, you know, supposedly she can't keep a man because she's too busy working and not fulfilling his manly needs. So that's one secondary image lurking in the background to this Rihanna cover. But again, controlling images never work alone. And even those older historical controlling images need their own secondary images to make sense. So in this case, if we're thinking about what a black matriarch is, we have to also consider what a good mother is or a good wife. Now, because this is the United States, we got to add a race component. Then we know that the racial opposition to the black matriarch is another controlling image we might call the good white mother or the good white wife, who is supposedly submissive to their husband, virgin at marriage, stays home with the kids, always has dinner on the table, etc, etc, etc. And to be clear, we could keep going deeper and deeper if we start thinking about the secondary images that might inform and surround the image of the good white mother. For example, we would expect a good white wife to be married to a hardworking, manly white man. And that idealized hardworking man is probably the opposite of a feminine man. Now, it's definitely possible to just keep going and add more and more and more surrounding idealized images. But at some point, you do have to decide where you're gonna stop adding more and more secondary images to your analysis. As a general rule, or the thing that I do at least, I really only trace as far back as is useful to my analysis. Now returning to the cover, it appears that the commentary is accusing Rihanna of being a version of the black matriarch. Clearly there's no white woman in the photo. That's true, but if we trace images through history, the reason the black matriarch image exists is because it emerged in a white supremacist patriarchal society that created idealized image of how white women exist. And importantly, as Hill Collins reminds us, even so-called positive looking images have the potential to be extremely oppressive as well. If you just don't fit into these images of a docile, obedient wife, there's a good chance that you'll be stigmatized as failing to achieve a legitimized form of motherhood or wifehood. So even positive images can be oppressive because they tend to prescribe social norms. So now we know that when you find an explicit image, if you trace it back through history, you'll find a ton more images. Even though they aren't explicitly present in a photo or a movie or a conversation, you can trust that those historical images are directly informing newer images. But also a side benefit of tracing images through history is that 
Society was far more explicitly racist and misogynist just a few years ago. So it's often easier to uncover all those connotations that have been inherited, which may or may not be more hidden in newer or contemporary controlling images, especially when those images appear to be positive. For example, I think that we can make the argument that the black matriarch image has made space for a newer alternate image. And we might even consider this to be a positive image. I think we generally refer to this idealization as the strong black woman controlling image. And this woman is supposed to be a leader, is independent, and able to make her way out of no way no matter what. Again, that sounds like a positive image. And perhaps sometimes it is. But it also inherits some of the main features of the black matriarch. Mainly the idea of independence and lack of reliance on men. Now when it comes to the cover, I think that both the black matriarch and the strong black woman image are present. This totally explains why there are essentially two completely opposite interpretations of this cover. Rihanna is either celebrated as a strong black woman or she is stigmatized as being too strong like the black matriarch. Okay, so let's finish up this analysis of the Vogue cover with a couple more observations about the controlling images that more so refer to ASAP Rocky because obviously certain controlling images are being applied to him as well. On this cover, he's not only positioned as a submissive feminine man in relation to Rihanna, he is also being compared to idealized versions of masculinity. Maybe we can call that controlling image the man's man or the tough guy. And then when we add in the racial component, we automatically start thinking about what it means to be a tough black man. And because this is a white supremacist patriarchal society, we can assume that an idealized version of black manhood is being built off of idealized versions of white manhood. Now, for whatever misogynist reason, in this commentary, caring for children is not seen as masculine behavior or even merely standing behind her or making less money. Those are all idealized behaviors that are connected to controlling images about men. So again, if we wanted to trace the history of controlling images for men, we need to look at the controlling images that emerge between men and women, but also between men and men. And then we would need to add a race component to this opposition. We may also need to add idealized versions of sexuality. After all, today, we have really only been talking from a super heteronormative perspective, but you better believe there's a whole world of images regarding straight masculinity and straight black masculinities and so on and so on. Okay, so the last step to a controlling images approach, uh, well, maybe not the last step, but the one more thing to remember. And this is probably the most interesting part. And I'm gonna introduce a new example in a minute so that we can start fresh. Okay, so the thing to remember, once you identify a whole bunch of images, whether implied, explicit, historical, whatever, once you find a bunch, Focus your attention to how all of these images work together to create explanations about how and why society works in a certain way. So what do I mean by that? Well, for example, it might look as though we're talking about only two specific people like Rihanna and ASAP Rocky, but really all those images are also working at a much bigger ideological level. Altogether, the images that are present, implied or explicit, they are telling you how men and women should behave in society. They are telling you what straight families should look like. They're telling you who should stay home with the children or who should make more money or who should be leading the relationship. Now, to be clear, all these assertions come attached to many different idealized images. So part of the challenge is extracting all of these individual assertions and then figuring out what they are telling us about society. Now, when I say it like that, it sounds really tricky to do, but it's actually something we do 
all the time. So let me just show you how it works. So I got one more example to analyze, but this time we're going to focus on what controlling images supposedly explain about society. When I saw this on Fox News, and after I got over how utterly disgusting the segment was, I remember thinking, holy crap, how many controlling images just came out of this interview? Here we're looking at an interview about the recent police murder of Tyree Nichols, who was beaten to death by five black police officers. When it comes to this particular police killing, Fox brought on a commentator that had a really messed up, shocking, but nevertheless extremely complex explanation as to why this police killing incident happened. Now, remember, I was talking about how controlling images come together and can become a kind of popular or commonsensical explanation as to why society works in a certain way or why something happened in a certain way. What follows is a perfect example of how controlling images come together and can be used to explain society. So let's play the video clip from Fox News and I'll be pausing each time a controlling image emerges. I would examine the racial element of this because there yep. is a racial element. And this is a story about young black men and their inability to treat each other in a humane way. Look like gang violence to me. Okay, so here the commentator describes the age of the men and then invokes the idea of gang violence. At this point, you can see a couple of controlling images coming together. Perhaps we might call it the young, aggressive, violent black man, or maybe the urban black gang member. So those are potentially two images. Now in the United States, it's been pretty common to question the humanity of black, brown, and indigenous folks by comparing them to animals. But nowadays, we got a better, more coded way to say that. Like, instead of saying they were acting like violent animals, the interviewee says that they are incapable of treating each other in a humane way. In other words, he's kind of saying that they are incapable of being fully human because they lack the capacity for empathy. Okay, so here's the thing. Casting doubt on whether or not a black person is fully human is like the first thing you learn in white supremacist kindergarten class. That assertion is super basic anti-blackness 101. As historians have shown many times, questioning the humanity of black folk was one of the central arguments that helped legitimize slavery. So sure, this interviewee is using different words, but it's also the same old bullshit. But also on a super basic level, have you ever heard of a group of white police officers murdering someone? Have you ever heard that ever compared to gang violence? Because I have not. But this conservative commentator goes much further and says even worse stuff. Because according to him, the real problem is single black mothers. It, it looked like what young black men do when they're supervised by a single black woman. So maybe for some folks outside of the black community, including myself, might first perceive all of that as a very random twist in the conversation. But actually, if you put this interview within the context of anti-blackness, this too is actually a really old misogynistic stance mediated through white supremacist ideologies. Okay, let's look at what controlling images are emerging here. Now this interviewee explicitly brings in the image of the single black mother or the bad black mother, who is imagined to be the cause of young black male aggression. A little bit later, he brings in another controlling image, the absent black father. Disrespect for authority that causes you to resist the police and run from the police and not comply with the police because you resist authority at all time because there was no male authority in your home. Okay, so we got at least three images here. The bad mother, the absent father, and the misbehaving child. Notice how when we put these images together, a whole little world emerges, a whole idealized family. This group of images, this family of images, is much more powerful than just deploying a single stereotype. When controlling images work together, and they always do, all of a sudden the conservative commentator is able to develop a coherent, 
holistic theory about what is wrong with the black family. I mean, sure, it's all ridiculous, but think about who is watching Fox News. Now, depending on who you are, I can imagine that what he said makes a whole lot of sense, especially having a black dude appearing to confirm and legitimize all of these white supremacist beliefs in the service of a powerful media institution. Very quickly, I'll address the elephant in the room. It's a black dude saying all of this racist stuff. It's like I've said a bunch of times across a whole bunch of videos, white supremacy does not need white people. If a particular action serves to enforce, legitimize, reproduce, protect, or disseminate white supremacist ideologies about uh, people of color, well, I feel pretty comfortable saying that, yeah, that dude has got some serious problems. Oh, and this dude doesn't stop there. He keeps going and it keeps getting worse. Eventually, as the interview rolls along, it becomes clear why he wanted to bring up single black mothers. It's because he wanted to accuse the black woman police chief of being a bad black mother to the male officers. And he could not have made that point more clear. Look like gang violence to me. It, it looked like what young black men do when they're supervised by a single black woman. And that's what they got going on in the Memphis Police Department. They've elected some uh, or put some black woman in charge of the police force. And we're getting the same kind of chaos and disunity and violence that we see in a lot of these cities that are run by single mothers. Okay, so notice this is a little bit different than the black matriarch image, who supposedly has the power to emasculate men. No, this is more of a complaint about black women not knowing their proper role in society. A good woman is supposed to be a mother. A good mother stays at home with the children and does not go to work. A good woman is a follower, not a leader. According to this guy, this police chief is not a good leader because women cannot be successful or authoritative as leaders. Now again, I can't emphasize this enough. When these controlling images work together, when you really look at all the ideological beliefs that are implied in each image, we end up with some serious explanatory power as to how society supposedly works. According to this guy, if we fix the black family, we will fix police violence. If women were to just stay in their traditional role in society, that would fix the family and by extension that would fix the problem of misbehaving children, which could potentially fix society in general. Now, if that is not a whole ass social theory about how society works or should work, then I must not know what a social theory is. I mean, clearly it's a stupid theory, but look at how complex it is when you pull it all apart, when you pull those images apart. Look at all the historical ideologies needed to help create those images. And also look at how when they come together, they appear to provide convincing explanations and justifications for the way society is right now. If we decide via the influence of controlling images that police murders are not about racism, but are instead about the black family, then we can expect government policy efforts to be directed at blaming victims of police violence, as opposed to holding police officers accountable for their actions. That right there is the way controlling images have the power to control or influence the unfolding of events. So to review, my list of things to remember while doing your own controlling image analysis. First, I would say, where there is one, there is many. Controlling images never work alone, and they need, need, need each other to make sense. Next, I would say, remember to look for oppositions. Now, this is a really good trick. If you see an explicit image about a woman, then guarantee there are images about men lurking nearby. If the image is about a good mother, then guaranteed you're gonna find images about bad mothers. So that one's probably the easiest one. Look for those oppositions. Next, I would say to find more images, trace the history. In general, 
always trace the history of controlling images that you can see. Because tracing the history is especially useful to find all the surrounding controlling images. And since older images were more blatantly racist or misogynist, it becomes much easier to understand what newer contemporary images are actually trying to say about society. And the last thing I would say to remember is when you see all these images working together, Ask yourself, what do they supposedly explain about society? In other words, like the clip from Fox News, that interviewee was able to extract a whole social theory about heteronormative black families. And it's really at this point that you see the real power of controlling images. They essentially help define and explain reality from a very specific perspective. So I think Hill Collins controlling images theory is super powerful and really helps explain the way stereotypes work in society. While perhaps these images don't determine what's gonna happen, they can literally influence the way events unfold and they influence the way we explain why they unfold that way. Those images pop up in regular conversations between friends, or they might influence the way a jury perceives a person that's on trial. Or in a different example, if you are a police officer and you think that all black men are aggressive, then it becomes a billion times more likely that excessive force will be used. If you think, for example, that Mexicans are good at working with their hands, then no wonder why Latinx children often get funneled into certain educational routes. If you believe that men are the natural leaders of society, then it makes it a million times less likely for people to vote for a woman for president. So when Hill Collins says controlling images have the power to control or influence society, she means it. Well, that's all for today, folks. Don't forget to like and subscribe. You can always donate to the Patreon. If you're interested in reading my work, you can always find it on academia.edu or maestromikemena.com. Once again, this is Mike with the Social Life of Language. And we're done.